Today, you guys are here for Jay Williams. Jay has over 25 years of experience across a wide variety of disciplines. He's held numerous roles, everything from general manager to vice president, uh, facilitator, keynote, and dialogue coach. With a focus in delivering exceptional client satisfaction, Jay has helped numerous clients achieve desired business outcomes through his leadership and contribution in the areas of sales, client services, and executive coaching. He, has, he examines the role of a leader using the blend of art and science, and he's also the author of the book, Leave Your Mark, The Thinking, Skills, and Behaviors, Behaviors of Influencers. A frequent speaker at industry events, Jay's warm and humorous, and at times a reverent style and gators audience in a way that keeps them on the edge of their seats, gives them confidence, and shifts their thinking. Please give a warm Dream Bank welcome to Jay Williams. Thank you, Jake. Jake, I want you to do my eulogy. I can't tell you when it's going to be, but if you'd be available, that would be great. So as I started today, um, I get a chance to speak. And one of the things is, is I envision myself as part of the audience. And so I want something that's engaging. I want the speech to feel like you know it's the first time the person's doing it. So when I was on the plane, I uh, actually Googled on Yahoo three best ways to open up a speech. So one of them was to tell a joke. And for those of you who know me, that was a risky endeavor to do. The other was to ask a question, which seemed a little calculated. The third way was to start off with a really, really powerful statement. So here's the statement I have for you guys today, and it's right here, is that business needs to spend far more time building trust and far less time peddling products and services. All right, so for those of you who don't know the story of Wells Fargo, about three and a half years ago, Wells Fargo had an initiative to grow their account base. And where they thought they could do is with their existing clients. And so what they wanted from their team was for them to open up more accounts. Well, the team took this to heart, meaning the entire company, and they did open up more accounts. There was just one little glitch there. They didn't get the permission of the account holders to do it. So if you aren't familiar with the story, that is what they're speaking to. And it's interesting. Trust is the new currency. This is the title of the workshop. And you see here that a financial institution, if we ever talked about currency, you guys would think we were talking about money. They are talking about trust. And what they said is that it was built on this, meaning trust, they said, we lost it, meaning trust, and our number one priority is building your trust. And so as I talk with you guys today, I want you to begin to think of some examples. And so I'm going to share some with you to spark your thinking. So it's football season, and it doesn't matter which team you cheer for. I realize where I'm at, so I'll be sensitive to that. But this is a universal statement. Have you heard a quarterback say, I trust my receivers. I trust my front line. And the reason they're doing it is in order for the relationship to work, there needs to be this mutual trust. Now, you think of the receiver when there's a high level of trust, the quarterback will actually throw it to a spot as opposed to the receiver because there's the trust between the two of them. Now, I think of trust when you think of Uber. Last night when I got off the plane, I called an Uber. Now think about this for a second, because as a little kid, are you taught to get into a car with a stranger, or are you taught not to do it? You're taught not to do it. Yet Uber has built a business model based off of trust, that you would trust a complete stranger in their car who can control the speed and the locks on the door to take you somewhere. What about Amazon? Anybody heard of them? Just, okay, you guys now haven't heard of Amazon. Really big company. So Amazon really, you know, began to cultivate this trust with its clients in a lot of ways. But one of the first examples that they had a high level of trust is people would give them their credit card number and they could keep it on file. How many of you would give your credit card to someone with that four-digit security number? You do it every day. I just want to show you that trust is the new currency. Amazon's leveraged their trust with you because now a complete stranger can come into your home when you're not home and leave packages there. 
So as we go through today, I want to give you guys real life examples of how trust is the new currency and how you want to be able to understand it and leverage it. And my goal today is to give you a working definition of it. I want to show you how to give it, how to get it, how to lose it, and how you could get it back. So as we go through and we talk about trust being the new currency, I, I want you to take my word for it. I want to show you from a societal standpoint, the people that we trust in society, they are gleaming on to the same messaging here. So Forbes magazine, which we all hold in high regard, this is what they said. They said, forget Bitcoin. Trust is the new currency. Business Entrepreneur Magazine, right here. Why trust is the new marketing currency. So for those of you who are listening and doing marketing or work in a marketing department, there will be a direct correlation between your success and the level of trust that you have with your clients. Forbes Magazine is the most powerful currency business today. So listen, as we talk, I always want to create a compelling human case for what we do. And for those of you who don't care about humanity, a compelling business case for why we would do this. So these are the things. What you want in business are really four things, regardless of the business that you guys are in. You want increased productivity, increased profitability, retention of employees, the good ones, and retention of clients. This is what's going to be key for you, is your level of trust. This is the new metrics that you want to measure. Now, I put this in about psychology today. In the course of 18 months, I mean, psychology is a study of human behavior. And this is what we're talking about, the human element. Now, you'll look at technology with artificial intelligence. That's going to be very difficult for them to replicate trust. And if you're in a business, this could become your point of difference. So as we look at this, I talk about psychology today because it's a study of human behavior, the way we think and the way that we act. They wrote 12 articles in an 18-month period. So I want to show you whether it's from a human perspective or a business perspective, psychology today or Forbes magazine. Unequivocally, everybody's in agreement that trust is the new currency. So this is from Huffington Post. It goes on and on. Here's what I want you guys to begin to take notes. And for those of you who have the worksheet, there's a fill in the blank there so that you can craft some of your notes. 82% of all respondents say that trusting their boss is essential. I didn't want to insult you guys, anybody who's out there, but I did want to give you a definition of essential so that we're all on the same page. It's absolutely necessary. It's indispensable. So if you're a manager, if you're an owner, if you're a leader, this is the currency. This trust is in, in, indispensable. Sorry, I stuttered there for a second. Indispensable. It's easy for me to say. So now what I want to do in shifting your thinking is moving this up on your list of priorities of the things you need to do. I want you guys to begin to think who do you need to build trust with? So if you're a manager or owner, it may be your employees. It may be your peers. It may be your vendors. It may be your employees, right? It may be your social circle. It may be your kids. What I want to show you is that this trust is applicable, has universal applicability to every aspect of your business and your personal life. So remember what I said, 82% of people who were polled said it's essential. Look at this. 63% of people said they don't trust their leader. So let's just break it down for a second. Eight out of 10 people say it's essential. It's a must. It's a non-negotiable. And six of those people say they can't trust their leader. Now, when I say leader, just so that we have a common definition, you can lead from anywhere. Leading is about influence. So whether you have the title or not, this is for you. You can lead. This is imperative that you can lead an initiative, a project management. You can lead a business. You can lead a family. All types of things, it's still true. So what we understand to this point is 8 out of 10 people say it's, in, it's essential, it's imperative, yet 6 out of 10 people don't think they have it. 80% of employees believe high levels of trust go towards innovation and investment. 
They foster both of those things. So again, if you're a business owner and you're sitting in on this, here's the compelling business case is that you need this creativity from your people and you need an investment. And let me just differentiate because initially when you hear that we're talking about currency, you might be thinking about money. It's imperative that you know, you may have someone's mental, physical, and financial commitment, but what you want as a leader, so whether this is in your church, whether it's in your community, whether it's in your business, whether it's in your family, is people's emotional commitment, their emotional investment, because that investment is the ultimate trigger for discretionary performance. So I just want to give you a little bit of a definition when we talk about this investment. It's about their emotional investment. And where you have trust in a relationship, you have someone's emotional commitment. And you need that emotional commitment. Unfortunately, you don't know if you have it until you need it most. Today, as we go through, I want you guys to, to, to write in your questions and to, to create questions. Today could seem a little bit more like a movie trailer than the movie itself, where it creates more questions than it answers. But that was really the idea of today. We only have a few minutes, but it's a lifetime of information. So as I go through, if it prompts questions for you guys, I want you guys to capture those, and you can write those in, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. 63% of employees don't trust their leader. All right. This, I don't think, is going to surprise anybody. I think it does disappoint us, though. And that 41% of people don't trust the government. This is not a political conversation. This is a human conversation. When you look at what's going on from a societal standpoint, there's a lack of trust, not only politically, but from a societal standpoint. But even from country to country, we don't trust each other. And so that's at a larger scale. But what's going on in your business? And where's the trust level? And as we go through, I want you guys to begin to think, is that who do I need to trust? Who needs to trust me? On a scale of 1 to 10, where is the trust? So as we go through, I want you to use that as a filter as we talk today, is that where am I on this trust scale with my people? Here's some ways to lose trust. So I'm going to give it to you guys um, how you can get it, I promised, and how you can lose it. It's not the only ways, but it's the top ways. One is poor communication. Two is a lack of perceived caring. Inconsistent behavior, perceptions of favoritism, lack of engagement, not owning up to mistakes. Imagine having to trust somebody in a position of power that wouldn't own up to their mistakes. And believe it or not, if you lie to someone, they won't trust you. Here's what's somewhat humorous about this. These are not complex items, are they? These are things that we can control. It's a mindset. And I'm going to share with you, so this is how you can lose that trust. I'm going to share it with you quickly how you can gain that trust back. As a leader, I do want to share this with you. If you're lacking in leadership skills, and I work with organizations, the people are technically sound. What's missing is leadership skills. And so if you are going to be a leader, there's going to be this combination of you being a manager and you being a leader, when I say manager, manager is someone who manages process. A leader is someone that leads people where people follow them, where they influence them. So if you want to build trust in the leader role, you need to display these skills and possess them. Here's some ways to gain trust, though. I want to give you guys that, too. Demonstrate vulnerability. I will share with you the number one opportunity for leaders that I work with is to display vulnerability. The reason that they don't want to do it is it's perceived as weakness, not by anyone else, but by them. Does that sound familiar to you guys? And so uh, Rick Warren, I don't know if you're familiar, he wrote a book called A Purpose Driven Life. And so I read it about nine years ago. I don't remember everything. I do remember this statement. And here's what he said. He said, people impress from a distance, but they influence from up close. And the way that they influence is by being vulnerable. 
So I would share with you, if you want to build trust in a relationship with your employees, with your peers, with your spouse, with your family, with your community, be vulnerable. Now, some people, someone said to me when I wrote my book, they said, well, you're really vulnerable in your book. I said, in which way? They said, well, you talk a lot about you know, growing up and your childhood and your mixed family and all those things. I said, I was transparent. I don't know that I was vulnerable. They said, well, what's the difference? Transparency is being honest and factual about something. Vulnerability is taking a risk that the person may think something different and even less than you after. So imagine as a leader where you go to an employee, you said, you know what? I completely made the wrong call. I shouldn't have addressed you in that way. Imagine going to your spouse. Just imagine, I'm not saying to do it, and going, hey, I was wrong there. Yeah, that's hypothetically. I'm not saying you have to do that. But imagine with your kids, and maybe you've done this before and you've seen this reaction. If you want to build trust as a leader, as a human being, be vulnerable with them. Show genuine care. So there's a funny uh, bumper sticker I saw one time. It said, sincerity is the key to success, meaning care, caring too. And once you can fake that, you've got it made. There's an old adage that people don't care what you know until they know how much you care. I'd love to give credit to that person. I don't know who it is. What I would say is that as a leader, people need to know that you genuinely care. That's a, there's a difference between maybe showing the behaviors of caring and the people feeling as though you care. Now, I will share with you, let me just think, uh, take you guys back to a time of customer service and maybe you experienced something and the person was less than cordial. They go, well, you know what, fine, we'll just give you your money back. Here, you can just have it. Or you know what, I'll just give you a discount. Does it seem like the person genuinely cares? No. But when you look at a Bombas, I want to give you real life business examples. They have a 100% money back guarantee. They want you to trust them. We genuinely care. I don't care why you don't like the sock. You could have lost one. Have you seen their new campaign? If you lose the sock in the dryer, they'll replace it. Does it not seem like this business genuinely cares? Bombas will donate a sock for every sock that you buy. Do you see how they've been able to build trust with their customer base? Now, there's something else that that trust will buy you is that the price becomes secondary to the experience. And I'm a huge fan of Bombas. When I first saw them at $12 a sock, that was approximately three times what I normally spend on a sock. And by the way, I'm a customer of theirs because I trust them. Be generous. And this is an interesting term to hear about building trust but what they have found, studies have found, is the way when people are generous with their time, with their emotions, with their resources, not always money, but generous as a mentality, it builds trust in a relationship. Your generosity may become in your satisfaction guaranteed. Your generosity may come in your margin of error with an underperforming employee, not just on the money side. Incorporating feedback, and this is a shameless plug, but I'd love to come back and talk about feedback. Feedback is free to you. It's the least expensive leadership tool that you have that gives you the biggest return on investment. If you want to build trust with someone, ask for feedback. I'm working with an organization. Last week, the vice president went in to one of his managers and said, listen, we've had excessive turnover. I think as a manager, as a vice president, I own a lot of that. What would you share with me in the way of feedback of things that I could do better? Do you see how trust can be built instantly? The person was vulnerable, showed that they cared. They're generous in the sense that I'm open. Whatever you have to say, and they're incorporating feedback. They admit mistakes. I would look for the opportunity, if you want to build trust, to admit mistakes. You guys have to write this down. I will give you the time. But tell the truth. If you lie, and I say this with a straight face, if you lie, people won't trust you. 
I know there could be some things that are going on in our culture that seem to contradict this, but it's not an authentic trust that you have for someone who lies continuously. All right, so that's the way you could um, lose it with your people. This is the way that they may lose it with you, right? So we talked about your relationship with them, how you gain and lose trust. It goes both ways. And as you guys go through, guess what? You're going to see the exact same thing. And this is the beauty of trust, is that requires is just a mindset. And it's simple things that I think that are, are common to us as human beings. They're, they're, um, they're not common practice. They're common sense. You've heard that. I don't know that they're common practice. But they're things that are very easy to recapture. For us, I want to share with you as human beings is that there's some universal truths. There's a social psychologist, Amy Cuddy. Some of you may have heard of her. She, uh, she uh, made famous that Wonder Woman pose. And for those of you who are watching, this is supposed to be my Wonder Woman pose. So if you just got on, you guys don't know what he's doing. But what was interesting is um, from that pose, what she found is that when women would do that, as little as 30 to 60 seconds before going into a situation that otherwise intimidated them, It helped their significance, their self-worth, and their sense of belonging. She wrote this book, Presence. And in the book, when she's doing the research, she found that unequivocally, every single human being looks for two things in every single interaction. This is universal across the globe. The number one thing is trust. And so as you're going through today, I want to begin to shift your thinking as far as where trust plays in your business strategy, in your personal strategy, in your marketing strategy, in your customer service strategy. You have to ask, and what I'm what I doing and what I'm doing, am I building or taking away from the trust in the relationship? Ways to gain trust? I just want to show you guys, it's not complex. You have to show people you care. You have to be vulnerable. You have to be honest. These are all things that we could do that require no money. And in a day and time where economically we're not sure where we're going to wind up in the next 12 months, this is as a human being and from a compelling business case where you want to double down. The businesses that have a high level of trust are the ones who are going to flourish over the next year, two years, three years, four years. It is the new currency. 82% of the people I told you don't trust the boss. By the way, this was globally. This was not unique to the United States. So they interviewed over 31,000 people. I have the data right here in over 26 countries. It's the largest survey ever. It is amazing. This is a human issue. And I talk in a lot of different industries. I'm very careful not to, I'll give examples within the industry, but what ails you in your industry is what ails humanity. And this trust component right now is what ails humanity. So let's talk about trust. So right now, I've talked to you guys about how to give it and how to get it and how to lose it. Let me give you a working definition. So I want to give you guys a resource at the same time that has heavily influenced my thinking as it relates to trust. There's a gentleman, Stephen Covey, Jr. So for some of you who are listening, you might be old enough to to remember Stephen Covey, who wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and The Eighth Habit. Well, his son, in his own right, incredibly brilliant, wrote a book called The Speed of Trust. And basically the premise, and I'm not minimizing it, I'm just trying to shorten you reading a book uh, for the purpose of our, our time here together, is that he found that there is a direct correlation between when there's a high level of trust and the height of the speed in relationships. And the lower the level of trust, the lower the level of speed in relationships. And so I'm going to share with you today his model that is shifted the way that I perceive the world and the way that I communicate and the way that I do business. There are two things that go into trust, character and competence. So if you're taking notes, the two things that go into trust, character and competence. The first thing that goes into character is intent. And intent is simply, why do you do something? And so I'm going to apologize in advance if you work at a car dealership and you are listening to this. This is not directed at you, it's the other people. But there's been a perception that's been perpetuated. In fact, the the auto industry knows this, and they've changed their model. 
is that the intention of a, a salesperson was not your best interest. Their interest was if there was a spiff, if there was a quota, if there was financing. Does this sound familiar to you? And so uh, my youngest son graduated from college, went to buy him a car. I had a set dollar amount in mind. This is how much we're going to spend. When we got there, the guy said to me, how much would you like to spend every month? I'd already done the research. I knew they were going to ask that question because they make a higher commission on finance deals. I said, this is the fixed amount. I said, I appreciate you asking. That's not important to us. I want to focus on this amount. In the course of the conversation, he turns to my son. He said, well, how much would you like to spend? But what happened instantly was there's this breach in trust. So when you look at companies like Carvana now, they have leveraged that mistrust. They thought, you know what? You'll deal with someone online. You don't even have to see the car. You can see a picture of it. But you can trust us. We'll ship you the car. You can keep it for seven days. If you don't like it, you can return it. Who would have ever thought that would be the business model for buying a car? I mean, if you go back five or six years ago, if you didn't like the car five minutes later, there's nothing you could do. And then they said, man, maybe it'll be 24 hours, take it home. I just want to share with you how the world is adapting, realizing what the currency is. And they've built a model now where they've built trust with their consumer. And what you're going to see is fewer and fewer car dealerships and more and more buying online because they have been able to create a higher trust level than what you experience in person. A little bit disheartening, but here's the good news, is that we can fix that. So intent is why you do something. As I talk about this, I give you the example of maybe a car salesman. Again, I say that that may be a dated reference, so when I share it, I share it in a dated way, maybe not a newer reference. Have you ever questioned someone's intent? And you go, the action is nice, but I just, I'm not sure why they're doing this. This doesn't seem altruistic. Are they doing this to make themselves look better? Are they doing this? Why are they doing this? Are they doing this for me? So in trust, I just want you to understand that your intention is a key component to somebody trusting you. A little bit of a life hack. If you want to heavily weight the outcome in your favor, start your statements off with, my intent is. My intent by mapping out this strategy for you, my intent by asking this question is, it'll heavily weight the outcome in your favor. What your brain will do will have to establish prior to what the intention is. And then you'll gain clarity for you and for that person that you're talking to. Imagine your kids come in right after curfew, whatever the case may be, and you say, listen, my intention is, you being home by 11 o'clock, is that I know that you're safe that I can get a good night's rest, and that you're well-rested for tomorrow. So if I come across a little bit strong, realize my intention is I love you and I care about you. Now listen, don't copy me word for word. It's not going to always work. I want you guys to replicate my thinking, not my words. It's to start out with my intent is. Let me just go back a little bit if I can. As human beings, we judge. There, there's a fundamental um, potential to have a disconnect because we judge ourselves by our intentions and others judge us by our actions. So I do a lot of work in the beauty industry. So for the people who are listening, 80, 90% of people go to a salon, they can relate to this. A stylist will recommend a product. The client will come back and go, oh, you're just trying to sell me on that shampoo, that conditioner, that hairspray. That's a fundamental example of what you have the potential for. The client judged you on the action. Oh, you recommended a product, you're trying to sell me. But for that stylist, their intention was to help you. They just wanted to help you replicate that look and feel the 28 to 31 days in between when they see you again. Do you understand the difference? I'm going to use an example, and it's heavily weighted with stereotypes, so don't, please don't judge me on it. But hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll illustrate a picture. Imagine a husband and wife, and now they found themselves in counseling, right? And now they're at a point where the wife is sharing back. Maybe they've had some agreement that she would manage that family and that life for them, and he would manage the financial part of it. And she said, you're not home for the kids, and you miss dinner. And when you come home, you're always on the phone. And he said, you know, my intention was so that I would create a life that allowed us to go on vacation, and maybe that you had the flexibility not to work, and maybe that we had an extra large vehicle. But who's wrong in that case? No one, right? 
But what happened is one person judged them on the actions, the other person was judging themselves on their intentions. And so it's imperative with trust that you flush out what the intention is and realize that may be a pinch point for why someone doesn't trust you is that they don't trust your intention. The next thing is integrity, and it's simply this, just doing what you say that you're going to do. So intention is why you do something. Integrity is doing what you say you're going to do. All right, so if you guys are with me here. So that's the, the character portion of it. The competence has to do with your capabilities. That's can you do it. So your intent is why you do something, right? Your integrity is do you do what you say you're going to do. That's why when you're late, it's not about punctuality. It's just I can't trust you to be on time. I can't trust you to do what you said that you were going to do. That's what that's about. Because some people, it doesn't matter if you're late. But if there's a rub there, it's because I can't trust you to do what you say you're going to do. Now, when I talk about competence here, your capabilities, is can you do it? And the next one is the results. Have you done it? So imagine that you guys, I want to give you several examples that you can see the applicability. When you go to hire someone, what you're really looking to determine is can I trust this person? So let me give you an example. Say somebody has a lot of jobs on their resume in a short period of time. You may not have a trust level with them as far as their intention. Are they just trying to build their resume? Are they just killing time? Like, what's going on here? When you look and you're talking to their integrity, do you do what you're going to say? So you ask them, you know what? Tell me about a time that you've led a team. Or tell me about a time where you had a sales goal. And how often did you make your goal? Give me a little feedback. You're looking back. Can they do what they say they, they said they can do, what they're telling you they're going to do for your company? Capabilities, right? Can they do it? So you're looking at their resume, and you're looking at the different jobs. You're looking at the job descriptions. And then ultimately, it's the results. Can they do it? And this is where you may have disconnect in your life, either personally or professionally, is that you may have someone whose intentions are good, and their capabilities are there, too. But they just don't do what they say they're going to do. They're going to start a project, and they don't complete it. Or they say they're going to have it done in a certain time, and it's not done in a certain time. Their intentions are good. They're going, no, 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 I meant to do that. Sorry, I just got distracted. Does this sound familiar to you? I just want to show you how you can break this down and understand it. It's not that you don't trust the person, because you do trust their intent in this case. And you do trust their capabilities. Where you need a greater level of trust is around your integrity and your results. There's big conversations to be had here. Today's the movie trailer, all right, to create some questions. So let me give you some trust facts here if you guys are taking notes. One, trust varies by task. And this is important to understand. It's not whether or not you trust me. It varies by task. So your trust level with me as a speaker could be very high, my intentions, my integrity, my capabilities, and my results. Your trust level with me as a brain surgeon could be much different. And it may not be based on my intentions, right? But it could be based on my integrity, being able to do what I said I was going to do, my capabilities, and my results. Think about in your marriages, for those of you who are married or in a relationship, is that, you know what, you look at the other person, your trust level with them as a provider, your trust level with them as a caregiver, right? your trust level with them as a friend, your trust level with them as a cook, your trust level with them financially. It's not whether or not you trust them or you don't trust them, it varies by task. Make sense to you guys? All right. So you guys who are watching online, just nod your head, that'd be great. Trust can be given two ways. And again, I'm giving guys this information at a high level, but these are things that will drive a lot of conversation for you later. Trust, how many of you, for those who are here and those who are listening, I want you just to think through, how many of you give the trust this way? It's yours to lose. And how many of you are, no, you have to earn it. I will tell you, as I travel, so let's just use the United States is the way that trust is extended in the Northeast versus the Midwest completely different. It's not a reflection of the character of the people. It's just based on their experiences, how they extend trust. 
It's important that you understand with your clients and with your people, are they the people that go, hey, I trust you until you do something to ruin that trust, or the type of people that go, mm, you got to prove yourself. So I want to share with you as you're going through is that trust varies by task, meaning the role that you're looking for in that person. And then it depends on how that trust is extended to someone, how you're going to capture it. It's on a continuum. Sometimes you go, I trust them. I don't trust them. You can have a little level of trust. You might trust someone's intent and capabilities, like I said, but you don't entrust their integrity or their results. So I want to share with you this trust doesn't always wind up as a, uh, it's an emphatic yes or an emphatic no. It could be a continuum, and it could be based on the task. Someone thinking that you have a client, I have a high level of trust as it relates to their engagement. Where I need to have a higher level of trust is on their payment of their invoice. But you don't need to say, hey, I need to get rid of that client, and I don't trust them, because you do have a high level of trust. What you want to do is engage in a conversation with them to have a high level of trust as it relates to your engagement and you're showing up for meetings and you're, you're, you're staying with the project line. I just want to know what would need to happen for you so that I could establish the same trust level as it relates to paying your invoices within our agreed upon 30-day period. I want to share with you that this trust is going to develop a new uh, verbiage and terminology for you as well. And what you'll find is that it's very non-threatening, and it's non-accusatory. Trust can be lost, and it can be found. Because one of the top questions I get is, can you regain trust? And the answer is, yes, you can. How long does it take? It depends on how much you have in the trust bank. And I will share with you that when something goes bad in the way of trust, you pay a dividend. There is a financial equ um, equivalency to what we're talking about, where it takes out of that trust bank. You need to have something in the bank. And that's where, as an example, with a new client, something goes wrong right away. You don't have anything in the trust bank. Now you have to withdraw from it where things could go wrong. But imagine a longstanding client that you have a high level of trust to it, and something goes wrong. They go, hey, don't worry about it. That's OK. Things happen. Did pay a dividend, but you had that money in the bank, the trust account, to pay for it. So as we talk about this, it can be lost and found. The more trust you have in that bank, the better it's going to be for you. We say that about money. You can see how trust is the new currency. Now, this is important for you to understand as we wrap up today, is that it's harder to recover from a breach in character and competence. So Target's based out of the Midwest here. You guys remember what happened about 30 months ago with Target? There's a credit card breach that went on. So if you guys look at that, you know, was that a character issue or was that a competence issue? Competence, yeah. And was it based on their capabilities or their results? Results. So, I mean, they're very capable. They've been around for years, and they fixed the problem just like that. Now, that cost them $287 million. Fortunately, they had the money and the trust in the bank. I still shop there. How many of you still shop there? They didn't take out an ad and say, we've been you know, part of the, the fiber of America for 87 years, and we're your neighbor. They didn't need to address that. What they needed to address was their competence and, their, and the results. The next day, they put, they put a stop on the cards immediately. They sent out gift cards to the people, and they had a remedy just like that. Now, you do pay a dividend, but they're able to come back. And for the audience who's old enough to remember Enron, it was one of the largest uh, in history, one of the largest companies we had. And what happened was is that the executive team was embezzling. And they were buying yachts and redecorating their homes. That company inside of two years shut down. I mean, they were going very quickly. But two years later, there's no signs of them. That was a breach in character, their intentions and their integrities. So I want to share with you is that where you may have a greater disconnect with somebody is around the character. As we wrap up, I do need to give you this disclaimer. Hope is not a strategy. It does not replace trust. So if you hope you'll make your numbers, if you hope this relationship would 
uh, will work, if you hope your kids will do different in school. What that says to me is, against all uh, logic, I want this to work. It's not a strategy, though. And so if you find yourself saying, I hope, what I want you to identify is that I've lost trust. When I look at character and I look at the person's intent and their integrity, I look at their capabilities and their results, it's not there. So now I'm going to deviate from stress, which is the currency. It'd be like if you didn't have any cash and you go, I'm going to use a new form of currency. That's what hope is. And just like, will you take this? And by currency, I mean credit cards, money, things like that. And so as a business owner, if you hope you make your numbers, if you hope your people will offer better customer service, if you hope they'll show up um, on time, if you hope they'll show up dressed a certain way, that is not a strategy. I want you to realize now I've lost trust. Let me see where I need to regain trust with those people. All right, who needs trust? I want you guys just to take um, just a few seconds and so that when we leave today, there is an action item. Who do you need to build trust with? So I just want you to take just 10, 15 seconds and just put down just a couple of either groups or people that you need to build trust with. Now that you've had that 10 seconds, who do you need to trust? So the first question is, who needs to trust you more? I'm sorry, second question is, is who do you need to trust in your life personally and professionally? Now you guys are going to have a little homework here because you're going to have to go back and you're going to have to look at, uh, by task, where do you need to trust them? The number one question, if you want to repair a relationship where there's broken trust, is where do I have trust? So um, I do mediation work, and I was working with two owners and, uh, of a business, and they came to me, and they said, we want to part ways. And we went from him selling to her to her selling to him. And be before we left, I said, I just have to ask you guys, is wh where do you have a trust level with each other? You know what's going on now? They said, we want to work together. He said, I trust her from an operational standpoint. I trust the way that she engages with our clients, the way she is with our employees. She said, I trust him second to no one as it relates to managing our money. What was interesting is that when we started off with what they had in common, where there was trust, they saw that they didn't want to have to extend trust in other areas to other people when they had this was the most important area that they needed trust. And I just want to show you a mediation that could have gone either direction, went a third direction when trust was introduced as a filter. All right, so notes for you guys. I want it to be full service for you. So if you don't want to write the notes, you can take a picture of the slide when you're done. Is that good? All right, there you go. So the first thing is trust is character plus competence. So if you're in a situation, you're at a restaurant, and something happens, and you go, what? There's a trust breach here, right? If something happens with your employee, something happens with your spouse, you know it's either character or competence. Second thing is what goes into your character is your intent and your intent and um, integrity. That's supposed to be integrity, by the way, your intentions and your integrity, not your intent and your intentions, because they sound like the same thing. Competence has to do with capabilities and results. All right, so you guys now have a working definition. You have a filter in which to make your decisions whether or not you trust people. A breach around um, and trust around character is much harder to overcome. That's why, and again, if this is a little bit too sensitive, I, I just want to illustrate the point. If somebody cheats in their relationship, that has more to do with a character issue than anything else, right? Financial issues, maybe you can recover because that may have to do with a capability type of issue. If you have an employee who steals from you, that's a little bit different than maybe an employee's not doing their job up to the, to the, to the level that you need. Trust varies by task. It could be extended two ways, years to lose, and you've got to earn it. And hope is not a strategy. So here's my wish for you. You guys will continue to educate yourself. This won't be the end. It will be the beginning that you guys will search out trust and building trust. The next thing is that you measure trust in your culture. There is a number. Therefore, you're ready. It's your retention rate. Your retention rate is your trust rating. If six out of 10 clients come back to you, then 60% of your clients trust you enough to do business with you. You seek feedback on how you're doing it, and do it early and often. 
How does that sound to you? Give me some feedback on you, from you. How fair does that sound? What would you like to see different? Those are all open-ended questions to solicit feedback and do it early and often. And don't substitute hope for trust. When you start using that word, I want you to stop and go, hey, I need to go back to trust. They may not be trustworthy as it relates to the tasks that you need them for, and that's okay. It doesn't mean that they're not trustworthy. Okay, guys. Oh, it did happen. All right. Bruce Lee said this. I'd love to take credit for it. But when I was training with Bruce Lee, this is what he shared with me. Uh, Bruce Lee, huge fan. Here's the deal. It's not enough for you guys to believe and agree with me. It's not enough. You will have to go out and do. And the do that I want for you guys is that wish list, but also to look at who do you need to trust in your life, your business and your professional life, and who needs to trust you. And on a scale of 1 to 10, see where those people, with 10 being best, where the trust level is. And if it's a 6 or 7, ask that person, what do I need to do to build a different trust level with you? To improve it. If you don't trust someone, it's not saying I don't trust you, just tell them I want to have a greater level of trust with you. I want to have that conversation with you as it relates to and fill in the blank. You guys have questions, you have comments. If you have jokes that I can use during the presentation, please feel free to email them. So nobody asked, unless it's going to be one of the questions right now, what is the second thing that every human being looks for in every single interaction. So the first thing we said is trust. The second thing is respect. 